Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at East Silicon with Tim Horrell, who's going to talk today about high bandwidth memory and how that integrates with an ASIC, particularly at advanced nodes. In the past, we had a memory bottleneck going back, what, 10, 15 years ago? It seems to be coming back again. What's changed? So you end up trying to, to drive a whole lot more bandwidth than is actually possible through the external memory interfaces. And the, the HBM interface solves that problem by, by reducing the power that's required to, to get the bandwidth out of the memory that you need. Is this just a function of more data everywhere? Is that what the problem is? Or is it uh, more transistors? Where are we starting to run the problem? Uh, if you follow Moore's law, what you end up looking at is the performance has to go up at a certain rate and the increasing data requirements for each of those applications is driving a huge increase in memory bandwidth. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure thing. So what are we looking at here? So in the normal circumstance, or, or what has been traditionally, the chip will talk through the board out to a, a DDR memory. That interface is limited by how many wires you can get into the area, how many DDR memory chips you can put on the board, and the total bandwidth with DDR4 gets you, with four channels, somewhere around 60 megabytes per second. And as, as this is moving forward into DDR5, this problem gets solved a little bit, but it's still incremental increases. It's not a doubling. If you move to HBM, the interconnect is much shorter. You've saved an awful lot of real estate on your board, and you end up with eight channel interconnect and a total of 256 megabytes per second per stack, and you can put as many as four stacks in one package. What's the next iteration of this? Is it more stacks of HBM, or is it HBM3, which we've been hearing about? Well, the common stack today is, is four memory stack. The current technology allows you to go to eight for uh, devices, which doubles the available memory. HBM2E, which is the next variant of this that, that we can see solidified now, gives you four times as much addressable memory in the stacks, but it'll still stick with four and eight high stacks. And HBM3 is supposed to double this 256 to 512, but that's far enough out in the, the future at this point that we don't really have a good handle on what that's going to look like. Is there any indication that this is enough for the foreseeable future in terms of data throughput, uh, signal uh, throughput, or are we still going to need more as we go forward? It's never enough. Uh, be honest with you, the, the, the rate at which we're consuming data is increasing exponentially at this point. And so this problem is always going to exist in the system architectures. It's only going to get worse. So if you're a design team and you're working with trying to get the throughput as fast as you can, what do you need to keep in mind when you're working with this? So with this one, if you want uh, to, to deal with this, this is a thousand data lines between the, the memory stack and the chip. And to do that, you need the interposer as part of the design. One of the things that's being done to lower the cost is to work out methods of doing that data transfer without having to use the interposer, such as the uh, redistribution layer uh, discussions that are going on on top of the, of the top of the organic substrates. But those those are as yet in the future. For now, what we're doing is continuing to increase the availability of the HBM2, solving the the reliability issues associated with the multi-chip devices and increasing the, the amount of memory and the bandwidth of the interconnect. How easy is it to integrate all these pieces versus, say, the old days when you would uh, hook an ASIC up to uh, classic uh, DRAM? In the DRAM, in classic DRAM case, you end up putting together what's called an I.O. ring. You have slices that you put in the ring for, the, for your I.O.s that create the transmission and, and receive signals for the interface to the memory. There's a tremendous amount of effort that's required to build that ring and to interface it correctly with your core logic. And what we've done in our IP is created a single hard macro that solidifies all of that, takes all of that complexity out of the problem. And this phi just goes right into your ASIC design, connects directly to the memory controller, and you're done. 
Could you go back a couple of years ago when people were just starting to build uh, two and a half D implementations? This was a very complex, brand new world. Has it become more um, mature in terms of you know exactly what to expect as you put these pieces together? Well, we've done enough of them now to say that, that this for us is a relatively mature technology. We've solved the manufacturing issues, we've solved the integration issues, uh, and we've delivered these things in uh, production-worthy devices. So we've taken an awful lot of the complexity out of doing this effort and relieved the, the issues on the back end through the production flow, making the qualification effort. So if you're a design team looking to implement a 2.5D implementation, what do you have to keep in mind that you, where do you see people go wrong on a regular basis? Uh, if they attempt to build this interface piecemeal, uh, in the old way that, that you've done with, with DDR, you end up missing some of the critical sub-functions that's required. We use a standardized interface at, at the core level the IEEE 1500 interface that goes back into uh, the, the controller for the device. And this simplifies dramatically the, the integration requirements. It also simplifies tremendously the verification requirements because these elements have been pre-verified. Whereas if you build this yourself, all the pieces, you have to go through the full verification flow for that. What are the initial advantages of any advanced packaging was that you'd be able to mix, say, 130 nanometer analog with a 7 nanometer digital component and it would all work together. Most of the implementations we've seen have not been that wide a spread in terms of different process nodes. Is that easier now than it used to be? With the 2.5D with the solution that we have, the answer to that question is sort of yes and no. It's yes in the sense that you could use an older process node to build your HBM2 stack. But it's no in the sense that the people who are doing this want the higher memory density. And so that tends to push you further forward in the process nodes. And so the difference between what you need in the ASIC versus what you need in the HBM is much, much smaller. And it's hard to, to say that you could use an older commodity part and go through all of the trouble and expense of doing this for a device that, it, that is less powerful than you could possibly get because you, you still have your memory constraints. In the past, one of the concerns about when we start moving into advanced packaging, particularly 2.5D, is how are we going to test all these pieces and how are we going to make sure that they all work? Has that been solved? So the answer to that question is yes. Uh, we've put in place a lot of work to solve some of the, of the uh, testability and manufacturing problems associated with this and have come up with techniques that are proprietary that allow us to ensure that the tested known good dye that comes in the HBM stack and the dye yield that goes with that uh, are a good match. And so the overall yield of the system is excellent. Tim Harrell, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you for having me.